while ago I pitched an idea to the group of guys that run this podcast uh, of doing like an introspective philosophical look into treasure hunting, uh, focusing obviously a lot around the secret and things like that, that discusses, you know, hot topic issues within the secret community, the, the hunt, as it were. I think that part of what makes the community ebb and flow so much is the fa- isn't just the fact that there's so many people in it. It's the fact that it's hard to be correct. It's hard to uh, agree with people on a level that, um, you know, actually takes people anywhere with, you know, in the hunt. And I think sometimes when we do these treasure hunts, there are, there are some pretty glaring um, key points that we forget. One of the most simple ones that I've noticed in the years that I've been doing this is the lack of difference that people see between argument over discussion argument doesn't really do anything for treasure hunts uh it's just two people shouting at walls essentially um or multiple people shouting at walls when people present an idea the most exciting thing about presenting an idea in in a community as large as ours um is is being heard in any way shape or form just the fact that it's out there and that you've you know you've taken the time to devise an idea and you want to share it with people sometimes we get really hasty and you know we just lay out a theory onto uh you know a word document or a pdf or something like that and just drop it on people and say okay here it is this is my idea on the other side of that coin when people present ideas to us um if we don't like them we often will pick them apart till they are you know bare bones essentially and you know that can be kind of harsh on some people and so it's important to look or to be able to look at everything from at least two sides you know what i mean the if i'm presenting an idea i'm going to present it from my perspective but i have to do so thinking about how other people might receive it right so let's let's take this the the st louis um thing for for a good example from the secret like so the majority of and i'm probably going to get a little flack for saying the majority but the majority of hunters in the secret um know i'm going to put that in quotes they know that image nine and either verse five or eight is montreal but there is a large cross-section of the population of of the secret hunters um, who believe that you know St. Louis has something to do with it, and what's interesting is is actually the the amount of people that believe that you know the um, puzzle takes you to St. Louis, and they've devised a lot of really good ideas about it. I'm not gonna lie. I, I mean, I'm I'm famous for being like I'm known for being a Image Nine Verse Five kind of guy from Montreal. Um, but I've read a lot of really compelling ideas about why it might be in St. Louis, like why people would, and it's not even so much I think that it's why they it might be in St. Louis. What's interesting to me is why they come up with this idea, you know, that it's that it's just it's not Montreal. They they've found a lot of evidence for themselves that it's there, and a lot of times, and I'm 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 kind of guilty of this myself, but a lot of times when a St. Louis idea comes up and it gets laid out the only retort that it usually takes to shut it down is where's your leg ear right mine's right here and uh you know it's it's really interesting because it's just that one clue that just kind of shuts it all down which kind of goes to show you the the power of vagary of like vague clues and stuff like that within a puzzle like this from byron's perspective it this would be amazing you know people looking at something like this and saying despite that leg eater it's there you know it's got to be in st louis it's got to be you know somewhere else and um you know and so they present these ideas and generally the first thing that i always say is where's your leg eater and then and that's i admit that it's kind of um a little shallow of me to do that I, you know and i'm using myself as an example because i don't want to speak for anyone else but it's just a little bit shallow and but it, that's all it takes you know like that's the that's really all it takes and so discussion doesn't happen after that and usually it turns into an argument of some kind i try to avoid those kind of conflicts because i don't like that sort of thing but you know it it happens and 
often the language that we use to discuss these puzzles changes really quickly. Uh, it can devolve really fast into uh, absolute absolutism. Sorry, and um, you know, it it turns into what I've what I've called absolution uh, absolutism over the acceptance of the chance to change our minds. A lot of times when I talk to George on the podcast, we talk about how we would love it for people to come and and make us wrong. You know what I mean? Like we have these ideas and stuff and everybody has these ideas, but it's within our willingness to change our minds that makes us, um, you know, that I think is what makes people continue to send us theories, um, you know, stay in the page in general, like in and, and it makes the population enjoyable when everybody can discuss things with an air of I might change my mind or you might change my mind. I think that makes it a lot easier to um, exist within this this community. Like, you know, there are so many ideas and all of them can be good and all of them can be right. Um, you know, but it's just it's a matter of how we discuss them together. Right. Like if if I present an idea and somebody just says, well, that's stupid then, you know, there's really no point in continuing that conversation because it's just the, they don't aren't receptive to hearing why or they aren't receptive to changing their minds. Right. I just I challenge people like if you are going to say if if we have differing ideas, you know what I mean? I challenge you to prove me wrong like, and I'm going to try to do the same. But we also at the same time should be trying to prove something right, even if it's not you or I, it's it's proving something right and finding some way to continue to move forward in these puzzles, right? Because we finally, we kind of, we hit a wall a lot of times, um, <clears throat> Cleveland, but you know, where it's, you just don't quite know where to go from a certain point. And I'm like, admittedly, I'm there with Montreal. Like I, I've always been a proponent that, you know, we would be digging, if this was 1985, let's say, um, when I was one, we'd be digging, uh, you know, at, at the Mount Stephen Club, and for me, it's really difficult to, like, I, I follow the path in my head that I, I theorize takes you to the Mount Stephen Club. And if it's not there, then I don't personally know how to take my head away from that spot. You know what I mean? And so it makes it tricky. And so, I, you know, I, I consult with people. I talk to people that I know are, are, you know, in Montreal. I talk to people that have worked that particular puzzle for, like, you know, a lot longer than I have. Um, and things like that and and so it's like I'm at a point personally in my puzzling where I'm waiting for something to compel me somewhere else if it's not here um, and you know I mean the problem with Mount Stephen Club of course is that it was dug up in 2011 and almost completely renovated in the front so you know if they found it we probably will never know um, but be that as it may if, it, if it's not there and, and Mount Stephen Club is, is merely a step in the you know in the path if you will then i don't know how to move from that spot and rather than try to force anywhere into you know that little package of where i could go i try to find people that can can help me move to a different spot you know like make make uh, this spot of montreal make more sense than the one that i have you know what I mean? And and not just make more sense for me, but make more sense on a, on a fundamental puzzle solving level. You know what I mean? Like there's it seems within the secret that there are a lot of solutions to 12 puzzles. You know what I mean? Like even and there's that debate, you know, was Boston actually solved? You know, was Cleveland truly solved? Was Chicago truly solved or, or you know, was there steps that you could skip to get from A to Z? without having to go through JK and L, you know what I mean? And it's a, it's a very, um, it's a compelling debate because it, you know, the answer is going to always be yes and no until we absolutely can see a template that was, you know, used to build these puzzles. If there are indeed, if there is indeed only one, um, you know, we need to be able to kind of keep open about it and discuss these things from a from a chance like from a place where we our minds could possibly change um and i think sometimes too we we fall into this trap of forgetting the difference between collaboration and simply working with someone you know like next to somebody in a in sort of a uh metaphorical sense if you will and 
there's a couple of points I want to make on this because I think a misconception about um, the secret, at least, is that, or like really any of these lo these armchair treasure hunts, um, is that they have to be done in collaboration with people. So this raises a few questions. First of all, is it necessary to work with people, like alongside people, to do these treasure hunts? And I think ultimately the answer to that is is no. I mean, you're free to to do these hunts on your own. For the first few years that I was in it, that's how I did it. I, I talked to nobody about it. I developed some ideas and you know understandings of the puzzle, and then the first person I contacted was JM. And I think what's neat is that like all the solved ones were basically solved by at least two people, right? So you know you had Brian and Andy in Cleveland, Jason. Uh, Krupat said in uh, EU, I believe, that you know, he and his kids sort of worked it out. Um, and you know, and then Chicago, you had uh, Rob Robell and everybody there. But it's what's interesting is like, if you were to ever if you could take the internet away from treasure hunters, you know, first of all, we'd probably never know about the solved ones unless you went to Chicago and met those guys or, or you know what I mean? Like, unless you knew them personally, you probably would never even know that they, they had found these things. Um, and so, you know, I want to talk about individual versus group work kind of thing, right? Like all of these puzzles, as I said, can be worked on individually. So it, you know, it begs the question, is it better or worse to work with somebody or on your own? And Obviously, that's a pretty subjective answer. I think it comes down to every, you know, it comes down to who is, you know, the person working the puzzle sort of thing. Um, and, you know, you can ask sometimes, like, are there times when collaboration hinders rather than helps? And I think the answer is yes. And the reason being is because people, I think people um, mistake collaboration with, um, you know, working with somebody and how do I describe that better like it's people often think that just because they are working in a group of people that they are collaborating collaboration requires back and forth um, it requires narrowing down of possibility and it requires uh, a, an absolute need to be proven right or wrong okay and what I mean by that is it so there, you need the back and forth, the exchange of ideas, and then you need to look at those ideas under sort of a microscope and decide which ones make sense to keep, right? So if you're looking at a puzzle like Montreal and you're in a group of people and somebody in there that's collaborating with you pitches the idea that it might be in St. St. Louis, just for example, um, you know, usually you point out to the leg eater and it's like, okay, well, let's discuss this leg eater because it's pretty obscure the only other one we know of that's exactly like it is in Italy um, and you know so if you can show me in St. Louis something that matches that better than the one in Montreal then by all means let's go and discuss that sort of thing right um, George and I once discussed in, in an interview um, the idea that of finding like a familiar thing that you know is in the world and starting from that point that was found and so it was easy to move out from that point into the rest of Montreal. Um, and I wonder sometimes if people, you know, like a lot of people just want to spitball ideas at each other and hope that they, that somebody tells them they're right. You know, like it's important to be correct to a large quantity of the, of the community. And this is where argument or this is where discussion sort of becomes argument. And this is where collaboration tends to fall, fall apart is that, you know, as soon as somebody tell, make, comes up with a better idea, you know, um, a lot of times people shut down. And it's unfortunate that that happens because if, if people could sit there and, and just like banter back what they were given to kind of make them want to shut down, then you've got a, a proper discussion. It's not an argument anymore. It's a proper discussion. It's somebody saying, OK, you've given me an idea. I've shown you why I think it doesn't work what do you think about that right and a lot of people you know i see it a lot where people just kind of you know they throw that famous line well you don't have a cask so you know you're obviously wrong and that just turns off everything 
um, it doesn't help us when it's pretty obvious that there could be more than one solution to a puzzle, like to actually find the casks or, you know, if you're working, um, I talk a lot about Kane's Jawbone because it's one of my favorites, but there are, I don't know how many possibilities of combinations of pages that like the idea behind Kane's, if nobody is familiar with it, is that it's, you were supposed to take out, it's a hundred page book and you need to, and the pages are all printed out of order. So what you need to do is cut out the pages. There's actually the little dotted lines with the scissors on them. You need to cut out the pages, lay them all out, and figure out the actual order of the, of the book. Um, there's a mathematical equation to figuring out how many combinations there are, actually are. And if anyone can figure that out and let me know, that would be fantastic. But um, I personally think working a puzzle like Kane's Jawbone would be, like working in tandem with other people would be detrimental in a lot of ways because you like it's just having so many different ideas thrown as to what order these pages need to go in would just cloud it up entirely like it makes it so hard and it's only a hundred pages but still and they're all printed on one side of the book that's or on one side of the page that's like an interesting part about it but um you know and then whereas things like the secret um it appears that you could find a cask without having to follow any kind of a path like i mean barring coincidence of course where you just you know like you trip on a rock and it turns out to be the lid from a cask that was pushed up because the ground started to whatever right or something along those lines but as far as like working on it and stuff like that like it's it is so much for the secret it's very beneficial to work on your own or to work in a large group of people for the secret it's a lot more beneficial to work in a, in a group of people. It doesn't have to be a huge one. Uh, you know, just a team of four or five people can, can do it. Obviously, they did it in Chicago. Um, two of them did it in, in Cleveland. You know, and knowing the histories of the hunts that you're working on and knowing how people on a macrocosmic level have sort of approached these things, you know, and doing so with a with an open mind to you know with the idea that you could have your your mind changed comfortably you know those are that's what makes it enjoyable and that's what makes it um successful i think is you know people that come together they doctor house these ideas down to a, to a single spot you know and then they go and check it out um you know, you have to wonder sometimes how many digs do we not ever hear about? You know what I mean? How many teams do we do we you know go out and and actually check out these spots and we never hear about it? You know, like that happens. I can guarantee you it happens. And you know, we don't need the rather I'm going to reword this. The groups I think are great for the presentation of thought out ideas. The groups are great for taking, so like with me and my team, get together and we kind of hash out some ideas. Once we're comfortable with it together, like once we've discussed it out and you know, maybe we don't agree 100% on everything, but we've kind of hashed everything out so that it's a, you know, things seem to fit the puzzle rather than we're, you know, we're not forcing the puzzle to fit our clues, things like that that's when we decide to present those ideas to the community, right? And I think sometimes um, in the information age especially, because there's so much coming at us so quickly at all times, people jump the gun on that and they, you know, they come up with their, their ideas, their concepts, and then they just throw them at the page and hope for the best, right? It's like throwing a, you know, a piece of bologna into a ceiling fan or an egg into a ceiling fan, right? Like it's just, it kind of just blows everywhere and people have to, you know, come at it from different angles and they pick up the little pieces and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird way. Ah, weird's not the right word. It's a tough way to start a collaboration with people because A, they don't see exact, like they don't see the whole idea at once and you know they have to pick up the small pieces metaphorically speaking metaphorically speaking and um you know and it, and it makes it tough because so much information is coming at us so fast right so taking the time to a build a small team or a big one whatever you're comfortable with b 
everybody laying out their ideas in a, in a sort of discussion setting where, you know, it's not you're wrong and I'm right. It's this is the idea and, and let's discuss that. Um, you know, the time has been taken to kind of develop the theory into a tangible, you know, thing. Some people at that point will put it into a PDF, um, you know, and then after all that stuff is done, it gets presented to the community and it, you know, it works so much better when you, when you've already taken that time rather than throwing an idea at a, at 13,000 people and saying, Hey, everyone take the time to discuss this idea. Right. Um, if you can turn it into something that people can't really necessarily refute if that's the word I should use, but, um, but you know, like if you can discuss it out with your team to the point where nobody can really tell you you're wrong, then, at that point, that's when you should present it to the community, right? Because a well thought out idea dissected by 13,000 people is going to get treated a lot better than, you know, 13,000 pieces of an idea. You know what I mean? It's a little tricky to kind of to um, explain, I guess, but I'm very open for collaboration on anything with this show. Um, I don't, I won't likely have guests. It's just going to be every week a, a really, you know, a quick blurb of a show. And, um, you know, today was just talking about little traps that we can be careful not to fall into when it comes to, uh, you know, these, these treasure hunts. As an aside, I wanted to kind of discuss the, um, you know, the anniversary hunt that just dropped recently because it was, it was really cool. I want to, I want to congratulate Arthur and, and George for putting together a really neat, idea um it seemed to have come at a very appropriate time um i'm not going to get into the the things but you know there was a bit of a darkness coming into the place and uh you know this puzzle dropped and it seemed to have kind of rekindled people's um puzzle solving motors if you will and uh you know that's something i think we can all get behind once in a while we need something that kind of you know, gets us thinking in the right direction again. Um, you know, there is the gift giver thing is, is one thing entirely, but, you know, having something that doesn't necessarily apply to the secret directly, but helps us, you know, keep that fire going. I think those things are important, right? That's what keeps us from falling into those traps is the, is the inspirations and the, um, you know, the friendships we build and all that, of course, but, you know, it's just important to uh, to have kind of a reamplification of why we do this in the first place. Um, friends, uh, adventure, knowledge, education, all these things, and um, you know, hopefully in the near future we can start to uh, you know dig deeper into a few of these other issues philosophically and stuff like that. But you know. I hope you enjoy this segment because I'm, you know, I, I've always kind of thought of myself, I think philosophically about a lot of things and, and not the least of which is treasure hunting, because if, if you look at it from a sociological perspective, it's, it's incredibly interesting um, how people's minds work when it comes to something like this. We all have the exact same goal, which is to pull these boxes out of the ground. But for some reason, and I want to get into this on another episode, maybe, for some reason, we don't have the same goal when it comes to the approach of the puzzle, just the actual, the final solution kind of thing. We, we all have that in common, but how we get there is, can be some, can be contentious sometimes. So just some things to think about. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion today. Uh, and if it works out, I'm going to hopefully pump one of these out every couple weeks uh, depending on what's going on within the hunt. I'll, I mean, I'm always watching and, uh, you know, the new Montreal episode is written. It just needs to be actually recorded and, and, um, I'm going to use the word performed. Uh, all right. So everybody have great days. Uh, cheers from Canada and, uh, you know, keep on digging. Bye.